I'd like to introduce my partner, uh, Don Tyler, who's helped me develop this new program. Don? So I'm Don Tyler. I'm helping Ray develop the program as a co-founder role. Um, my background is I own a dessert business. Um, I'm an executive coach and a guide in training. I've done the, a program with them. We did a weekend, we went away, we did hiking, and since then, I've been working on my own daily practice in the woods to kind of deepen this work. And I'm here to support Ray in any way I can, answer questions later. How many hikers do we have in the group? Yeah, okay, so, um, so after 30 years in, uh, as a psychologist, seeing individual clients and groups and all different issues, uh, I decided to retire and needed a break. So where did I go? Uh, was out on the Appalachian Trail. So I went out with the lens of a psychologist and uh, IFS therapist. IFS stands for Internal Family Systems. So that's how I saw the Appalachian Trail. <clears throat> Although um, I'd spent years going into the White Mountains and climbing uh, all the 4,000 foot peaks and running the trails. Uh, my real interest in going out on the Appalachian Trail was to spend time with me. And so uh, that's what this presentation is about. I'm gonna try to take you on a hike or offer you an opportunity to take a hike by watching some of the pictures that I have. Uh, there are over 5,000, so <clears throat> I didn't bring them all today, not to worry. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, what happened during my hike uh, <clears throat> developed into a program that Don and I are trying to roll out now. Basically, it's therapy in the woods. So uh, if you have any questions about that, we're, we have a website that you can uh, check out. What is the Appalachian Trail? Well, 2,200 miles. It goes from Georgia to Maine and uh, passes through 14 states. It's hard and it's long. So here's a little history. It's kind of a crowded slide. I didn't really put it up there for information. I think I just put it up there because I was impressed with the number of traumas and uh, use of the trail as a place to go to kind of uh, relieve yourself of burdens. So the, uh, the founder of the Appalachian Trail, the guy who came up with the idea, Benton Mackay, he just lost his wife. So what he did, he connected with all his hiking buddies up and down the coast and he said, I have this vision to put together a, a hiking trail from south to north along the east coast. Send me your favorite hike. So think about that, you have a friend and you're gonna send them your favorite hike. So that really describes the Appalachian Trail. This thing goes up and over the craziest places and it really is challenging in every section of it. The first person who really hiked it was Earl Schaefer. He was a radio man, frontline radio man in the Second World War and he hiked it to hike off the war. And today, every year, hundreds and hundreds of veterans coming back from combat are hiking off the war. So I got to meet a number of them and I always ask, you know, what is it about being out here that, that's helpful to you? So that was my curiosity. Emma Gatewood is one of my heroes. She, uh, Grandma Gatewood they called her and uh, she was a domestic abuse survivor who went out and hiked, uh, hiked off the abuse, if you will, uh, on the trail. She did it three times and she did it with a gunny sack thrown over her shoulder and tennis sneakers. So uh, the other thing impressive to me is in 1968, Congress passed something. <laughs> <laughs> the National Trail System Act. Okay, let's play Stump the Google Staff. I couldn't help myself with this. So what is the highest point along the Appalachian Trail? Say again? Nope. It's Klingman's Dome. I thought it was Mount Washington too. Klingman's Dome, it's, uh, it's in this, the Great Smoky Mountains and between uh, Tennessee and North Carolina. It's 6,643 feet 
and uh, Mount Washington is only 6,266. So I went running up Klingman's Dome, got to the very top, and there's a tower that you walk up on, and it was pea soup fog, so I didn't get to see it. <laughs> What's the correct pronunciation for Appalachian? Appalachian. Well, that's good. It's Appalachian when you're in the south. And as soon as you get to the Mason-Dixon line, then you call it Appalachian. So they all knew that I was from the north. <laughs> What's the length of the Appalachian Trail? Mm, yep. <laughs> you heard me say that. All right, 2189. It changes. It, it was 2,000, and it's grown over the years. So how long does it take the average hiker to hike the entire trail? Yeah, four months, kids. <laughs> it took this guy seven months, so with a lot of zero days. Zero days means that you try to recuperate. How many calories per day does a 150-pound person hiking the AT burn? 4,000. 5,000. Four, That's right. So if you, uh, if you break that down into weight of carrying the food, weight to carry, it's, uh, it's about uh, 10 to 15 pounds of food you carry when you go out in the bush. You go out for five or six days, four or five days. So we were always trying to balance, <clears throat> you know, number of calories with the amount of extra weight. So that's why we all ended up very skinny. The good old days, I miss it. <laughs> so lessons along the trail, 165,000 white blazes, and they became precious. Wow, another white blaze, except <clears throat> they're the same whether you're going north or south. So uh, I discovered that uh, several times. Uh, one story is that I had just uh, seen the second time the same spot. And I thought to myself, isn't this wonderful? You know, wow, this spot, I, I climbed the mountain, and the same exact spot on that side is this side. That's really interesting. <laughs> And as I finally got reoriented and turned around, I saw a guy my age at the top of the mountain going around in circles. He said, hey, are you on the Appalachian Trail? So I didn't know what to say because I was the wrong way on the trail. So I, uh, I didn't know how to, he said, stop, don't go anywhere. So he came down <clears throat> and we talked about these two old guys disoriented <laughs> and really not knowing which way they're going. but. At least we were on the trail together, so that was, that was fun. 262 shelters with campsites along the trail. In the Smokies, they want you to stay there. Uh, in the shelters, keep all the campers in one place. But as soon as we could, we, we got away from the shelters and, and into the, uh, into the uh, wilderness. 27-pound pack, which included all the food and water. I usually carried about a liter of water and then a filter to filter water from the streams. There's a hand pump, three to eight liters a day, so my hand got kind of tired. Ah, uh, this is a typical meal. See the 6,000 calories? is cheese, rice, and hot dogs. These damn hot dogs <clears throat> stay in your pack for a week. I couldn't understand why they never spoil. <laughs> <laughs> I got to love hot dogs. There's my jet boil. And uh, here's the uh, different campsites. Um, the one in the lower right was about the third night, fourth night out in Georgia. And that night is the first time I ever slept under lightning storm holding on to the tent because of the wind. I had it staked down, but I was holding on, lightning, and aware that there were dead trees around. So I, I uh, put my pack, pack frame over my head. So I, they were pulling my body would get crushed. So this was a real uh, interesting experience. And that picture always reminds me of it. Uh, this is what the shelters look like. Uh, I avoided them uh, as much as I could, except one night <clears throat> in uh, North Carolina. It got down to seven degrees, 
and it was snowing, snowed about a foot that night, and so there were 12 of us spooning <laughs> in the shelter, and uh, I was glad to have my, my buddies there. It was really a great night. This is, was the preferred way to camp. This is Jane Bald at uh, near Roan Mountain in Virginia. Okay, so uh, here's the arch at the beginning of the Appalachian Trail, not quite. From this arch, you still climb another eight and a half miles to get to the start of the Appalachian Trail, which is at the top of Springer Mountain. But uh, I remember the uh, wonderful feelings of, uh, wow, letting go, and this was gonna be a wonderful uh, uh, sojourn, a spiritual journey, and uh, I was gonna do all this work on myself, and great expectations. So how many people here have it on their bucket list? Okay, be careful, that's what happened to me. I put it on my bucket list, and then uh, once it's there, it's gotta happen. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, so this was March 6th was my start date. And at, at the base of the uh, Appalachian Trail, right at that arch, is this quote. I love this quote from Harold Allen. Remote for detachment, narrow for chosen company, winding for leisure, lonely for contemplation, the trail beckons not merely north and south, but upward to the body, mind, and soul of man. So, would you like to take a hike? <laughs> All right. See if I can pull it up for you. I have a warning. Um, music. I both sang my own music, made up songs, I whistled, I did uh, drumming with my poles. Uh, I was all about music. So we have a little bluegrass band, my partner and I, and uh, so that's where this music comes from. <laughs> Sit back and relax. There's a well-beaten path on this old mountainside where I wandered when I was alive. Oh, I wandered alone to a place I call home. From those Blue Ridge Hills I did roam When I die won't you bury me on the mountain Far away in my Blue Ridge Mountain home Oh my thoughts wander back to a ramshackle shack In those Blue Ridge Hills far away where my mother and dad are laid there to rest. They're sleeping in peace together there. Oh, I love those hills of old Virginia. From those Blue Ridge hills I did roam. When I die, won't you bury me on the mountain? Far away in my Blue Ridge Mountain home. I return to that old cabin home with a sigh. I have a longing for days gone by. When I die, won't you bury me on the old mountainside? Make my resting place upon the hill so high. Oh, I love those hills of old Virginia, from those Blue Ridge Hills I do roam. When I die, won't you bury me on the mountain, far away in my Blue Ridge Mountain home, far away in my Blue Ridge Mountain home.
How'd you like the music? It was great. <laughs> I was thinking how wonderful it is that you're talented enough that you could provide your own music. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That's good. So how many of you use nature and wilderness to unwind, to rejuvenate? How many? Just put up, put up your hand. Really, tree. You need a tree. A squirrel. Right, chipmunks, deer, oh my God, the deer are beautiful. And the bears really were scary until I encountered them and I realized that they're like, they have a soul, they, they, have, they have thought, wonderful feelings. They raise little kids. So that's what I learned after this story. So I went down a trail, listening to my uh, music, unaware of anything. And all of a sudden, this little black bum ran out in the middle of the trail, shot ahead of me, and right up a tree. What was that? So I uh, turn and I'm looking around, and this growl came out of the bushes with this huge mother bear right next to me, closer than that. Five feet? Yeah. And so she was fumbling another cub. And so I did my procedure, which is to make myself really tall and hold up my poles and click them. And I backed up like this. Mother bear came down the trail like this. And I was not afraid. I'm afraid now when I think back on it. <laughs> but I wasn't afraid. And what I realized was um, I had practiced this procedure. If I ever encountered a bear enough times, I'd actually rehearsed it, and I was able to get beyond my panic, my fright, and feel compassion, because this was a mother, two kids out of control. One of them shoots in front of this crazy hiker, and the other one, she doesn't know where it is, and she just wanted to take care of her kids. So those moments really connected me to, to nature and to the, the magic of it. So I'm glad to see many of you are equally connected. So I look at these two pictures before and after the trail, and I ask myself, what's changed here? More than that, what's changed, how do I keep it? So since then, I've been going out into the woods every day to do some variation of a practice. You know, I, I thought of myself as a trail yogi years ago when I go up into the White Mountains and meditate on the top of a mountain. But, um, but after the hike, uh, I've really gotten into um, finding that energy from nature, connecting with it, and then from that place, examining all the stuff that I'm going through, all the stresses that I put on myself. So we're trying to roll that out as a program. This is my quote. The ideal of hiking the entire trail in one season was indeed romantic. The reality, perhaps a bit harsh. Here was a trail. I thought March in Georgia is going to be spring. Well, this is what we found. This was a foot and a half of snow on the tent. The night before, we had all spooned in the shelter together. And I said, oh, this is just too close for me. Seven, seven degrees, though, made it worth it. This night, it was recorded zero degrees. I woke up, and the, my sneakers were frozen. And so um, the, the good and the bad of it, and sometimes it happens together. So as I figured out how to thaw out a sneaker by bending it, and then finally I was able to get my jet boil working and boil a little water, and just finding, seeing myself do these survival things 
was was a beauty in itself and really made up for the uh, cold. I woke up to my bear bag. We have to hang everything in trees to get smell out of the tent and food away so the bears don't come in the tent and get your food and you. So there's my bear bag, that orange one up there, uh, hanging, and I woke up a coffee addict knowing that's where the coffee was. So fortunately I got it and then I my granddaughter taught me how to do selfies, so I, I enjoyed a lot of selfies. This is that day at the top of Standing Indian Mountain. It was uh, blizzardy. Oh, so it's not all bad. We had what's called trail magic, and that is all of a sudden when you're really thirsty or hungry, you come upon this little thing that's been put out for you by another uh, hiking club or an individual and we call it trail magic. One day there was a guy cooking breakfast from the, from the back of his pickup truck. Paul, quiet Paul his name was. So, uh, so this was trail magic. So this was a terrible day, mile 650. It was like nine and a half hour day. I was hot, sweating. I was just not in a good place. And I came to the war spur shelter and lo and behold, I came down at six o'clock and I look, there's an empty shelter, the war spur, and there's wood all ready to make a fire. And oh, you see the Pops Blue Ribbon? So they, somebody left two full cans of beer, which I, I'm gonna go take and put it in the stream. <laughs> So, this is like my lucky day. <laughs> this is my lucky day. <laughs> I'm glad I videoed because uh, as the memories fade, these things were real. <laughs> all right, trail names. We, I didn't know anyone's real name. We all had trail names. There's mine in the middle, Mountain Music. And yeah, you know, I play bluegrass music, but it was really about when I got going, really got humming and got to be like one with nature, I could hear music from the mountains. And so I realized that that was my trail name. So I was a mountain music. Toodles was a uh, work for the Democratic uh, Party somewhere in Washington. When they were gone, he said, to hell with this, I'm going out on the trail. So he, he was a, a friend, x-rays from here, x-ray technician from Boston. Kaleidoscope was a woman. She said she had a kaleidoscope of issues. She was trying to work out on the trail. <laughs> she was fun. And Ghost Hiker was, was great. Ghost Hiker would hike along with us. We'd see her now and then. And all of a sudden at night, she'd disappear. She had a hammock. She would go into the wilderness and find a place for that hammock and come back. One day I asked her, I said, how are you so brave to do that? You know, I mean, I was trying not to be gender thing about it, but the woman. And she said, oh, he said, I, I love it out there. She said, I'm not afraid at all. Well, why not? She was LAPD, retired. <laughs> <laughs> so she was fun. Um, but spending six months alone in the beautiful wilderness with nothing but my mind to keep me company might have been boring if I had been hiking alone. But I wasn't. Let me introduce my friends. How many people meditate here? Okay, so when you begin, do you go down and kind of like it's chaos, chaotic? Right? So that's what I experienced too, and this is, this is a representation of that. But as we, as we do trail meditation, uh, and here are the steps. I've got it broken out into the word peace. The first step is to prepare and to try to connect with nature. But I'm able to find this mountain music guy and my psyche can show up. And from that place, I try to examine parts of me. See the parts in the back of my head? Parts that might be up. In this case, this one here in the center is the pilot navigator part. 
So I really got to know this part and really respected it. It was a guy pilot is always working for efficiency. You got to hike just the right speed, just the right amount of water, the right weight. Navigator was trying to keep me in the right direction on the trail. So I got to know those parts. But then this guy over here showed up in the back of my head. And I had to look at him, and he says, I'm not going to make it. So I very much had that part. And so as I worked through my trail meditation, I spent a lot of time in that um, higher place trying to connect with the part that was afraid and didn't think he was going to make it, especially the climbs. Some of the climbs were ferocious in the rain and in storms. So, uh, so I spent a lot of time quelling that, those fears. And from that, this guy emerged. And I call it the mule. And the mule says, we're going too fast. Of course you're afraid. We're going to slow down. Well, I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. So I tried it. And what happened in my head was the pilot part showed up again. And the mule, see, he's trampled him. Mule says, no, we're going to go slow. Pilot says, whoa, we got efficiency here. You're never going to make uh, in Mount Katahdin, in Maine. You're not going to make it. So I had a real battle. Does anybody have battles in their head? You should do the work. OK, good. So I had a real battle. And what I did differently was to take them on a hike. Say, OK, this is our hike today. I want to hear from both person, both people, both parts. And so I began to see how much like good management this really is applying all your good management skills to managing the different voices, different aspects of yourself. That's what this program we're trying to roll out is all about. What I did with these two parts was to negotiate a piece. And it went like this. When the, the slope gets tough, incline, the mule can stop and stand there and not move till he feels like it. And that's OK with the pilot. It's OK with a pilot because it's not on the clock. So I, so I said, I'll take responsibility for the time. We'll figure out a way. But right now, the mule gets his time. So I was able to plod up these hills. So mountain music, me, could best manage our inner world. But at times, he would get tired and disappear, burnout, leaving a management vacuum. <laughs> that kicked my butt. You're too damn slow, he would say. And so um, it brought up a child. I like this little cartoon picture, which I have the certifications for each of these. <laughs> uh, with a little backpack on and sitting on a curb. Does anybody have that part? No, once in a while. Go there. So he's called Slowpoke. And uh, so I did my wilderness meditation with Slowpoke and Drill Sergeant. Convinced Drill Sergeant, you know, he was, a, he was good. I like him. I need him. You know, he drives me through things. I need that discipline. But you know, you're hurting the younger part. You're hurting the more vulnerable part. So I got the Drill Sergeant to see that. I didn't know before that we can really work with the different aspects of ourselves if we pay them attention and focus on them enough. This is the guy that developed Good Step, became Sure Step, the guy that could go down the slippery rocks, have fun. Uh, I like him. He showed up, dead man walking. <laughs> this was uh, uh, July 27th. Today is, what, August 3rd? So I did a blog. You can check it out. It's raymountpsychologist.com. But here was my jog entry on a year ago today from this guy. The march up to New Hampshire's over 4,000-foot mountain peaks has been grueling. So I'm taking a few days off to rest, sail, and eat. My legs feel like rubber, and the thought of climbing another mountain seems torturous. Last year. I would look forward to coming up to the whites and climb two or three in a weekend, all in good fun. I miss the joy of climbing. 
So I've decided to do it in four day chunks, three days off, four day hiking. So I was able to renegotiate and give my system what it needed to enjoy this hike. All right, who can guess what the other part is that's in my head causing this guy? Got it. <laughs> That's a beer drill sergeant. I want to leave some time for your questions. Team meetings, I'm a big believer that we both become better outside managers when we become better inside managers and vice versa. When we become good outside managers and we can take those lessons inside that it becomes um, seamless. So. I'm learning to be a good manager of my guys. Uh, we put a team through this training, and here's the team. We had a great time in the woods. It was right here at Hale Reservation. Anybody go out there? And there's, yeah, wilderness camping out there and wonderful trails to hike and run. So we would do like a two-hour uh, solo hike. It's all solo hike. Then come back and circle up and talk about the experience. And so uh, we had our first class. You see Don is right in the center of it. He was there. So we'll be doing more of that. So the team wishes to say goodbye and thank you for listening, my team. And I want to dedicate this hike, uh, this uh, presentation, to the friends that got me here. So I'm drinking a beer out of my water bottle, I'll confess to that, and smoking. <laughs> smoking a cigar when I got down from Mount Katahdin, uh, thanking my parts that got me there. Questions? I have a somewhat technical question. Um, you said that um, going up on one of the mountains, you kind of lost the direction. Yes. You didn't know where, whether you were going north and south. I would have figured that everyone just takes a GPS you know, a hiking GPS to figure out where they're going. Yeah. How does that work? I have a GPS, and let me tell you how it works. <laughs> Take this thing into the shower <laughs> and try to move it. It doesn't work. A lot of times, you know, here it is, my cell phone. I couldn't take a picture or I couldn't work a GPS. And at other times, the pilot part and the navigator part, navigator part likes to fake it. It says, don't worry about it. We'll get there. So I'm in a lot of denial around that. So uh, I got in trouble. And I learned about that part and how important it is when it's chirping at me. I need to stop, make sure I know the directions. I was an ADD, hyperactive ADD kid. So working with that is interesting. GPS, this iPhone 7. Plus was great. Pictures, videos, GPS, uh, gives uh, internet, all the, all the hostels you can stay in. So, good question. How'd you get, how'd you get lost, Jerk? There's only two ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, let me ask you two, I hope, quick questions. One is, I'm curious about how you prepared physically to do this before you uh, yeah. went on it. And my second question is, during the course of this thing, did you have any really serious injuries or illnesses that caused you to actually get treatment off the trail that you couldn't deal with yourself? Yeah, I had no injuries that I had to uh, get treatment off the trail, but I had severe shin splints for three weeks. And uh, that's when I started calling myself Slowpoke. And that's when I really had to work with that part, Good Step. And we limped into Damascus. And when I got into Damascus, uh, I knew I was done for a while, so I took a, a room for three nights. So the, the first day of rest, I was so excited to get back into the mountains, but I rented a bicycle and I went up that way. So that was a little rehab. And then uh, uh, the second, second day, I took a slack pack which is you dump your heavy gear, take just a small pack, and do a short distance. Cut my distances down, soaked my ankle regularly in streams, and massaged it. And I, I worked through it. It's also some cannabis cream that's pretty good stuff. <laughs> How did you prepare before that? 
Yeah, prepare them before the hike. Well, you know, I've always, um, I've always tried to stay in some kind of shape, physical condition, and, and my uh, method of choice is usually trail running. So I'm in the trails, I'm running or hiking. And then I did a lot of the 4,000 foot peaks. I have all the, the 48 of them now. So I'd go up to the peaks and I'd load my backpack up with cans of food and I'd hike up and down the peak for practice. But reality, you really can't train for this. You get in, you get in shape as much as you can and you just start off with what your body can take and slow down. Because the difference is this is not a weekend thing. It's chronic changes everything and so it'd slow down so we would start with only eight ten miles a day and then as your body and spirit can handle it you build up your you build up your distance I've heard about uh, um, youth uh, programs sort of related to this like uh, wilderness therapy programs for yes, uh, for kids through DYS and the uh, juvenile system and so forth um, I guess, as an open-ended question, what's, in your mind, what's the relationship between what you're doing and that? Is there any at all? Can you imagine young yeah. people in, being involved in this? Yeah, I, I absolutely can, and I'm, I'm in touch with, have not met yet, a Michael Glass, who's, uh, who's at the University of New Hampshire, and he's uh, kind of the guru of the programs around. He does a certification for the youth programs. But it's, it's about using the, the magic healing powers of nature. You know, part of our uh, uh, belief is that as we've evolved from nature, physically, spiritually, and other ways, also our healing ha has evolved from nature. But it ended up, you know, the hospital, we no longer. So uh, if we return to nature, we can heal spiritually, you know, heal mentally. The difference is that I'm an IFS trained therapist, IFS Internal Family Systems, and you can go on the website and check it out, and it deals with parts. So as a lot of these programs, like you're gonna work on your car, so you think of your car, your mind, as one thing. So does the mechanic think of it that way? Mechanic's thinking, you know, he's testing which system it is, ah, here it is. Right, a carburetor, now I'm going to take this apart and I'm going to fix that. That's this kind of therapy and that's how it's different. We're isolating one, you saw the slide with all the mess of all the different parts in it. So what we're trying to do is meditation to get down to isolate one of those parts until we feel good towards the part and then really work with it. And in my case, I hiked with it. We had many conversations. We have a political part. We, we ran for president, <laughs> gave political speeches, but it was all important for me getting to know these parts. Like on your committees, you get to know the members of your committee and you'll be a better manager as a result of that. Did that answer it? Yeah. Okay. Completely different kind of question. Why south to north? Is that what everybody does, or how did you pick that? Yeah, it's the traditional way, south to north. Uh, works out weather-wise, um, but the, uh, the trail folks today uh, advise not doing it that way. Actually, they advise flip-flopping, so you can do sections of the trail when they're not crowded. I went with the bubble, very crowded. We have maybe 5,000 people that started, maybe 1,000 finished out of that group. But, uh, but you know, resources were difficult. Uh, if you cannot do it south to north, go for it. If you cannot do it in one season, that's advised too. <laughs> How much does it matter to do a line instead of a loop when you're thinking about, I mean, when you're thinking about enjoying the wilderness and experiencing it and you're experiencing yourself? A line? Yeah, doing an end-to-end, -end, something end-to-end -end yes, instead of yes. coming back well, where you started. You know, what I've learned about the wilderness is, one, I haven't known how to approach the wilderness in a way that allows me to really do meditation. I'm too fast. I have parts that push me. I want to get exercise in and I want to get time in and I want to go end-to-end. 
you know? And uh, what I discovered is that there's a, ex there's, a, there's a pace that I need to stay at in order to really let my mind uh, open and, and, uh, and empty. And uh, Don, if I can use for an example, his, uh, his trail meditation is sitting in the wilderness. So here's what I'd suggest. Go into the wilderness and stand there <laughs> and see where your body takes you. You know, maybe you'll, I, I know a guy that plays with the water in a stream, but it's allowing yourself to connect with what's, what's around. Can you do it here in the city? Maybe. <laughs> Do you need do you need uh, nature? Can you do it with a brick? Maybe or a computer? I don't know. No. <laughs> okay, I agree. But but uh, but to, but you know inside you know what you need to have peace. I always thought that people hiking the Appalachian Trail would try to do it in one season, but you just recommended not doing it in one season if you can. Now, my question is. How long do you think you would need to be on a hike to get really to the point where you can let go and meditate and yes. really get to the point, yeah. whatever that point is? Well, I would say that seven months is too long. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, parts came out in that seven months when I was burnt out that I hadn't really seen before. Um, I think in a couple of minutes, some people can get into a good Meditation? Who, who said they meditate here? All right, so how long? Definitely 10 minutes, 5 minutes. 10 minutes, 5 minutes? I think the answer is the same. It's that you're unique. So if you uh, experiment and find your place, find your way. Right, there was a question before about how you prepared or didn't uh, yeah. beforehand. What was the longest uh, continuous hike that you had done in terms of days out or nights out prior to doing the AT? Yeah, so I did the uh, Pemi Wilderness uh, for three, three nights and did uh, three or four peaks out there. Did Alice Head, came down in the nighttime. That was froze and then crossed the river <laughs> at night. Uh, so. I, you know, I'd done a lot of that. I, I like to do that. I just, uh, so, um, I think that was my longest, three, three days. But it, it just changes when it's three weeks. <laughs> when you're out there five days and you say, geez, did I talk to anybody today? No. Did I talk to anybody yesterday? I don't think so. <laughs> Have I had reception on my phone? I, I don't know. It changes. But it's fun. You get to really know yourself, and that's the uh, that's the draw. Um, you mentioned many times uh, the, about hiking the peaks, and I just wanted to say that um, it's not just about hiking the peaks. I think you can have the same experience just hiking. Yes. You know, flat or or the peaks or up and down, and yes. it's just about being where, where it feels like you should be. Yes, yeah. May, may I tell a story about that? So I've been in the, uh, the Fells Winchester Reservoir. Uh, most, most days I go there and then I'll go other places. One day I was just so open and just, uh, it was my birthday actually, and I had someone call me and sing to me, but I was just so uh, there connected to nature and I was running very slowly and I came across a deer and I slowed down and I walked and the deer was on this side of the road, saw me, walked across the road to the other side, stood and looked at me and wagged his tail. Have you ever seen a deer wag his tail? They flip their tail up and they take off. This deer wagged his tail, and I felt like I could have gone over and pet him, but I didn't want to invade his space. So I walked, I don't know, this, this far away maybe, and we looked at each other, and I was the one that broke the contact. I never had that experience, and I can only attribute it to I was that open. 
Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you, Ray. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it.